What is going on, everybody? It is Mark Cardula, lead faculty and CEO at Modern Pain Care, where we make you the complete clinician. Coming at you this week with a clinical topic to discuss that's been coming up a lot of questions that we've had with some of our students, but also um, we're seeing some discussions a little bit on social media. So we thought, what better time to come in and have a podcast about uh, this exact topic? And the topic is lumbar stenosis. It's one that we see clinically regularly as far as diagnostically, and we'll talk about diagnostically versus clinically relevant is probably one of those questions we need to be asking ourselves. But before we dive deep into the stenosis topic, let's hear how our colleague and co-host is. Jared, how, how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. Uh, I don't know if um, anybody that's listening has been following my whole house building process, but uh, I finally have a foundation, Mark. I finally have a foundation. They got ready to pour it um, a month ago, and it has done nothing but rain over the last month. And then we finally had two days of no rain. I have a foundation. It's curing. So hopefully soon I'll have some boards, you know, I'll have some, I'll have some framing up on a foundation. So I'm getting excited. This is my first house ever. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty pumped. That's good. That's, that's a cool experience. A little stressful at times as far as deadlines and things that sometimes get delayed and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, and I know right now in the construction industry, there's some challenges they have with supplies and different things. I'm sure you're well aware of that is, isn't in the process and all these things, but yeah, it's fun to see the house come from like completely dirt up to, you know, foundation and putting some boards up. And then eventually, man, that's going to be where I, where the, the, Soon you'll have the Jared Hall, you know, office, you know, space to where you can just be a, a machine. I, I, I might charge a consult call, you know, fee. Maybe it's, you know, a batch of your wife's cookies or anything just to talk about some, you know, uh, audio visual design, some, some, you know, cameras, you know, different lighting aspects. Um, I'd nerded out way deep on that with our office too. Um, that was the one, my only begging thing that I had is like, you gotta let me have an office, honey, so I can do some of this stuff online and. Thankfully, um, my wife's been hugely supportive and can't, wouldn't be doing this without her, of course. Otherwise, she would probably have gotten frustrated and wanted to kill me years ago with me putting as much time in. But she's an amazing lady. But, but that's beyond the point. We're, I'm getting off topic. The topic today, Jared, lumbar stenosis. What, that's one of those clinical phenomenon and clinical diagnoses we see quite a bit. And sometimes it's a lot more nuanced than, than I think we give it probably credit for. So what are your thoughts around lumbar stenosis? What do you see and what are the questions you're often fielding around lumbar stenosis? Yeah. So, you know, we just in the last like month, we've had this topic come up four times in our, in our coaching sessions, or at least I have with different people. And, uh, you know, I figured it would be a good, good time to do an episode, at least to briefly talk about some of the concepts. There's no way we could cover everything, but, um, I, I think that first and foremost, we have to determine, uh, you know, actual clinical stenosis versus just imaging findings of stenosis, right? Because you get a lot of referrals, any older person that has, you know, difficulty, maybe standing up straight or some pain in their, their buttock or posterior thigh region. And the automatic diagnosis is lumbar spinal stenosis. And of course, they do imaging, we do some x rays, or we do some MRIs or whatever it is. And we're like, Oh, man, you know, they have a they have a narrowing spinal column, or they have narrowing neural foramen, foramen, foramina, whatever you want to call it, whether it's central or, you know, foraminal stenosis. And we, we just get this diagnosis. And you know, we automatically start treating people for stenosis when maybe, maybe it's not that clear cut. So it, it's definitely got us with uh, the differentiation between imaging and diagnosis of stenosis. And is it true clinical stenosis and the ruling out of vascular pathology as well? If people have, you know, pain, that, pain in their legs, pain in their lower legs you know, while they're walking and that sort of stuff. So, so making sure that you rule out the scary stuff, you rule out the vascular stuff and then determine is this, is this truly clin clinically presenting as a stenosis type problem? I'm just hoping my wife's listening to the podcast today because I'm going to talk cardiopulmonary physical therapy. She's an instructor in our cardiopulmonary program um, in our physical therapy because I do think the vascular component is greatly under examined. Um, and uh, we've really tried to harp on our students in our clinic because I'm a clinical instructor. I do more you know, mentoring and folks in clinic than I do in the classroom, although they do allow me to torture students in the lecture halls once in a while. But yeah, let's let's step back and look at you know some of that you know peripheral vascular disease type contributions to this. I mean, there's a couple of ways you can get after. <clears throat> is it you know, you know truly you know neurogenic claudication or is it vascular claudication? So it's, is it the truly the nerve is being compressed in the spinal column, like Jared said, centrally or more laterally in the foramen, uh, foramen 
or is it, hey, we're, we're dealing with peripheral vascular issues. It's more of a blood supply vascular claudication issue. Well, a couple of things. I mean, obviously you would expect clinically if there, if that's truly um, vascular claudication, it shouldn't be mechanically positionally related. Now you'll hear the folks with the neurogenic claudication where, yeah, the grocery cart, man, if I lean forward, it's, it's all good. I, I, I can, um, or I have to sit, I can't, I can't stand anymore. If I have this pain that starts uh, going into my legs, vascular people, it doesn't matter. It's a, it's simply a, you know, demand of, of oxygen and blood supply that isn't happening to the to the you know metabolic demand of the muscles in the legs that it just eventually you start getting some ischemic pains in the legs because you know the the demand is 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 overarching the supply and people start getting some ischemic pains in the legs and it doesn't matter if they're sitting standing and walking it's just a simple rest thing um, that that can uh, be the key there the other clinical factor that I think is worth considering in your clinic or, or measure is ABI testing ankle brachial index testing where you're you know, doing some, some math, which, you know, can be challenging where you're, you're looking at, you know, the, the, some of the equations between the ankle and brachial blood pressures to see, Hey, is there a, is based on certain ratios? Um, you're, and I'll, we'll, I'll pull those up here in a second when I bring them up on my little cheat sheet in my computer here was when Jared takes over chat and um, but yeah, that's a way where you can, and we have a Doppler in our clinic where you can, you know, do the old, you know, pump up the, the cuff and then just, you know, start having the patient or you start letting loose the cuff to all of a sudden you hear that, that pulse reestablish itself with your Doppler. And then there's your, your systolic pressure. So you're using your systolic pressures to determine how good that blood flow is. But yeah, so being good at screening, obviously you're looking at the patient's history. If they're a long smoker, they have a lot of comorbid health issues with that would lend yourself to think that, Hey, there's probably some high likelihood of some vascular issues they're dealing with, you know, cardio, uh, coronary artery disease, things like that. You, you should be entertaining that diagnosis regularly. But <clears throat> any other thoughts you have on the vascular claudication? I know there's some bike tests and different things out there. Jared, anything else you do to kind of rule that out or, or rule it in in the clinic? Yeah, I think there's the, uh, I don't know why I remember this, but it's called the the bicycle test of Van Gunderlin. Um, it just sounds so uh, prestigious. Uh, I don't ever use that test. I use the treadmill walking test uh, pretty frequently where, you know, you have somebody walk, uh, flat on a treadmill until they start to develop symptoms. And then you increase the incline and you dramatically increase the incline pretty significantly uh, to a point where it causes them to lean forward on the handles of the treadmill and increasing the, the height of the treadmill should actually make vascular claudication worse because it's a more cardiovascularly demanding activity walking uphill. Uh, but it should theoretically make uh, neurogenic claudication better because while that person is walking, now all of a sudden they're leaning forward and they're mimicking the whole shopping cart sign type of deal uh, where they're going into some lumbar flexion. So that's something that I'll use pretty regularly. Um, I'll also just use, uh, you know, if they're, if they're fairly... Um, you know, I guess irritable, I might use a, just a standing test as well, you know, just have somebody stand in place for a while. Or, you know, I notice like when we're, when we're talking about something, I'll just have them stand and see how long it takes them, you know, their symptoms to come on. And if their symptoms come on, then I'll have them walk, you know, walk aggressively, walk fast and see if that actually increases or decreases their symptoms, you know, so it's similar to the, to the treadmill test, but just using clinical reasoning to understand that physical demands versus positional demands, uh, so that those are really the main ways that I go, go about it. But once we've rolled out, uh, once we've ruled out vascular stuff, where do you go next, Mark? Yeah. Vascular stuff. Once that, then it's like, okay. Uh, Cause uh, again, if, if people in age groups, when we start hitting sixties and seventies, the incidence of, of stenotic findings on imaging is pretty, starts increasing. I'm not saying everybody in there, everybody has it, but um, so you just got to be careful. Are we treating diagnoses or are we treating people? And that I'd say we got to go to the latter because some people carry those diagnostic findings and have zero clinical symptoms whatsoever. So it's our job to look at mechanically, does that stenotic finding, bear, is it looking like it's bearing clinical symptoms? And by that, you can test it. So what would you expect clinically to find if you have somebody who's got clinical lumbar stenosis? If you load them into flexion, symptoms should get better. If you load them into extension, symptoms should get worse. There are definitively folks, and, and this is again, probably my, uh, you know, MDT or repeated motions bias that 
get termed with it because they do have the imaging findings, but and they have a brick of a spine that will not go anywhere near extension. And our our imp, especially we get this bias like, oh my god, they have lumbar stenosis on film. I should never even think about extending their spine because it's going to make it worse. My question will be, it might, but do you know? Are you do you know that or are you thinking that? And you don't know until you test it. And that's where I'd say you, there's easy ways you can set up clinical scenarios where you test that theory out and see if in fact it is truly a extension you know, compressive neurologic issue, or is it just extension? We would say dysfunction where the tissue is just stiff and that doesn't, you know, move into extension because the person has a life that doesn't often put them into that load. Um, and then ways that I'll do it clinically, because that's often the question, the quickest way to answer for me is uh, let's get them prone and see if they lay prone comfortably. Like, well, God, it feels okay. Um, you know, often they'll say it's stiff in their back and then gosh, you know, then I might even do some CPAs, UPAs. Maybe you do more of a manual therapy approach. That's cool. CPA, UPA in there, see if you can loosen up some spine stuff and then recheck. Like, and I'd often look to see, are they starting to extend? And if they extend, are they getting peripheralized? No, it's extending and staying in my back. Um, or you might do repeated motions, get them prone on elbows and start working up into that stiffness. And you're looking for what is, is anything changing? Are there, is their symptoms peripheralizing into their legs as you would expect if it is clinical stenosis? But we often make that jump of it because the imaging findings there, it must be clinical stenosis. And you miss patients who actually need extension because they're so stiff. Maybe in, often it's extension, not just at their, at their lumbar spine. They need to open up their hips a little bit. They need to start working posterior chain stuff. I know people hate the whole posterior kinetic chain stuff. I, I, I sometimes feel like scared to say things on this podcast because I'm like, I'm going to get a freaking a tidal wave of what are you talking about with this stuff? But anyway, working muscles that often don't work a, a lot in their life, getting them some varied movements and varied muscle activity. Um, to start getting them standing upright and moving a little bit better. But yeah, that, that thought of we have to bias everybody towards, you know, flexion for stenosis, you know, is one of those things that is your treating diet, you know, and it, again, think about what, if you, if you step back and you talk to the clinician or to the patients, what was your clinical exam like when they've diagnosed you with that? Well, my doctor didn't touch me 75, if not 80% of the time, they haven't even got a physical exam to determine if that's clinical stenosis. They come into the doctor's office, they've got back pain, radiating the leg. And they get imaging and that's been the extent of their you know mechanical movement examination use your freaking degree people and don't just treat a film like it's like you were just being mindless drones well the doctor says it's stenosis therefore i'm come on we're better than that <laughs> we need to do better than just freaking treating treating prescriptions anyway i'm on my soapbox dude get me off of it but any other thoughts you have or things you find pointers you can give to people on the on the clinical versus imaging stenosis front, Jared? I mean, the, the, the big thing that jumps into my mind is the fact that um, a lot of people say, well, the patient will say, well, I have stenosis. What are you going to do about this? Like, you can't open up my spine. Or I've talked to a lot of therapists. They're like, well, this person has stenosis. How, how can I do anything about it? Like, I'm not going to be able to open up their neural frame and they're just going to get mechanical compression. And there's been a lot of studies uh, coming out recently about physical therapist perceptions towards back pain and that sort of stuff, right? So if we have these negative perceptions towards the, the diagnosis of stenosis, we're probably going to be scared to try to load somebody into extension. We're probably going to say, well, we're just going to throw in the towel and I'm just going to teach you how to activity pace because, you know, you just need to sit down, you need to flex, you need to make your life really small because you have this stenosis and anytime you stand up, you're just pinching on nerves, right? Well, I don't like that concept at all because there are so many people with the imaging findings of stenosis that have no symptoms for one. Uh, and then for two, we know that the nervous system is highly adaptable, right? So, and, and maybe... People have just gotten sensitized to extension and sensitized to the mechanical load that they get on their nervous system when they do come up into uh, a fully erect position or an extension. And guess what we're really good at? We're really good at dosing exercise to gradually habituate somebody and have allow them to have positive adaptation towards a position or towards an activity. And maybe if they get symptoms after one minute of walking now, well, Maybe we can't make them never have symptoms again, but maybe we can get it to where they don't have symptoms until 20 or 25 or 30 minutes of walking and all of a sudden they have a life again, right? Um, so that, that's one of my biggest pet peeves is that people just stay away from extension if somebody has stenosis. But if we're going to live our life, if we're going to do things, if we're going to allow people to have activities that they're not, you know, overly restricted in, that, a lot of that occurs in extension. 
and we've got to train extension and we've got to be very purposeful about training and dosing and progressing the load of extension to allow the nervous system to adapt. Yeah. Kind of like you do when you have somebody who's got a uh, ischemic, you know, vascular claudication legs, you know what you do, you walk them into symptoms till they get better and their body adapts and gets less sensitive and, you know, more efficient with their, you know, vascular claudication issues into their legs. Same thing, get people back into life. But if, if we say, oh, I can't change it, it's, it's, it's irreversible. Yeah. You're not going to change films. We're, we're not here to change films. We're here to change people and, and how they move and how they function. And, uh, you know, doesn't, and that film doesn't need to change. Um, you know, Jared has shared some of the research that's been out, I think 2015, Anthony Delito's work that compared PT versus surgery. Cause then some PTs want to just, and I'm not just saying PTs cause I, and I might've been this PT a little bit too, where I can't change that. They're going to need surgery. And on what surgeries does those folks get? It ain't and your little laminectomy, discectomy. It's often a multi-level decompression fusion that, that, uh, man, you, you, I've seen some outcomes from that one that, um, haven't been all the more pleasant. Not saying there aren't people walking out that are just have, did very well with it. And there's probably some clinically appropriate people that get to that point where it's just that severe. They need to, to go to it. But why don't we let the, see if they can start doing the things that Jared said. Let's see if we can habituate. Let's see if they can, we can capitalize on an adaptation. I know I remember, I can't remember which, uh, who was talking about this. Maybe it was Adrian's uh, courses. Maybe it was Michael Shacklock stuff. But that nervous system can change shape. What can you start as like a nice round nerve can start turning into this little flattened oval type nerve as over time, if it's slow compression over time, where nervous systems don't do well as if it's sudden change in where all of a sudden, you know, this circular nerve also gets, you know, significant pressure on it. But yeah, our, our bodies are adaptable. Give them a chance, you know, to do it and, and don't and have a narrative and own your biases before you do it. Because if you go in a clinical scenario with negative expectations, why on God's green earth would your patient have any positive expectations? And you're not going to be really, you know, given your, your best effort to start a- adaptations if you don't think it's even possible. So, and there's plenty of data to show, like you compare and the, the Lido's work with looked at surgery versus non-operative care. There's not a lot of great support that surgical care is amazingly more uh, successful in stenosis. So um, I think we can save our patients a, a pretty nasty stay in the hospital and a pretty painful procedure and, and, and give them their life back. And I mean, get them, get them to do things that, yeah, imaging hasn't changed, but your life changed. That's what we're after. So, um, any other points you'd have for, for students or clinicians who are looking at the lumbar stenosis? I mean, other things I would recommend before Jared chimes in is just Julie Whitman's got some articles out there. She's published about two or three, um, that are just worth, they look at some of the regional interdependent things. I know regional interdependent, you know, can be a little bit of a, a topic for some people like, but you know, getting the hips loose, you know, get friggin' hip, 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 hip extension moving into, um, into the game so they can start getting upright with that. You know, maybe you can get extension elsewhere. Maybe the thoracic spine can extend a little bit and, and help in decrease some of the loading on the, on the lumbar spine as well. Those are two areas that I think are definitely worth your time to address, uh, with that. I getting people prone and getting, you know, putting those PA moves into the hip again, we're not probably, we're, we're probably just introducing desensitization to loading in the directions they haven't been uh, loading their hips into that they can start hopefully loading with actively without us having to passively do it. Um, maybe you don't even need to passively do it. Maybe they can start loading immediately on some half kneeling hip extension work and then getting over the back of a chair or a foam roll with their, um, you know, some of the folks in stenosis age groups don't do well laying over foam roll or some do. Um, but again, you, you can test that clinically and for the unique person that day in front of you, maybe that works beautifully. But anything else clinically you think folks should be thinking of when it comes to stenosis, Jared? Yeah, you know, I was going to mention the <clears throat> the regional interdependence of looking above and below as well. Um, you know, I'm not uh, necessarily a thousand percent sure I understand exactly how that works, but clinically you do uh, consistently see when you improve somebody's hip extension uh, or ability to maintain a more extended hip, they, they tend to have a reduction in symptoms as well. Uh, and, and we could we could get into the nuance of why that is, but I don't really care mechanistically why that is as long as it it is consistently and, you know, uh, reliably Uh, improving symptoms. I think that that's valuable. And then secondarily, if you do have clinical stenosis, stenosis, well, guess what that is? That's an intolerance to mechanical load to the nerve, right? Well, there's lots of ways to mechanically load nerves and it doesn't just have to be looking at extension. There's all sorts of, you know, sliders and gliders and tensioners and all, you know, all sorts of activities that you can do in hamstring stretches and whatever, right? That you can mechanically load a nerve 
and maybe it's more a little bit of a tension loading in that in that scenario but you can mechanically put load through that nerve to ideally start desensitizing it a little bit right because the people get in this cycle of extension doesn't feel good so i don't extend and then guess what happens? The nerve becomes more sensitive to mechanical load and to any sort of mechanical load because they're avoiding mechanical load. And you get in this cycle of maladaptive changes towards, you know, sensitization. Well, OK, maybe they're really sensitive to extension and physical you know, compressive or mechanical load that way. Let's work on tension loading. Let's really tug on that nerve in a position of comfort for them with where their spine is in a position of comfort and see if we can start desensitizing it, start habituating it towards mechanical load that way. Right. So there's, Mm -hmm. there's other ways that you can come you can go about this. If you're not thinking about, well, the nerve is stuck and I need to make the nerve move. Right. Or I need to change the spine. If you think about it as a load sensitivity and a mechanical intolerance to load that is potentially adaptable, you can come up with other ideas to, to load that system and you could come about it different ways that I think are maybe pretty helpful. Yeah, no, completely agree. Um, and I also agree like region independent, we don't perfectly know the mechanisms of it. And then some people are like, well, we shouldn't even do it. Like what if your patient's condition says it gets better when you do it? And yeah, granted, I, I don't have a perfect mechanism that I can go on a, a stage at CSM and, and proclaim as the way it's working, but it's working for the patient in front of you. So don't just because somebody on social media um, screams about the oh that regional appendages this stuff is and you know it's garbage and there's no mechanism validity to it. Okay, yeah. So yeah, we don't necessarily know how it works exactly, which doesn't mean we just throw it away because it, you know if it works in your clinic. But again, you got to validate it, not just assume it works for everybody and just blindly regional independent people because well you know Mark and Jared and other people I've I've done coursework with says that that's you still have to have a clinical process that it gets validated through and that your test retest and all the things that instead of you're, you're fitting it to the patient, not just assuming that every patient needs it. Um, so yeah, no good points, Jared, appreciate it. And hopefully you guys have found some value with that. If any of you guys are listening and you're looking to start getting into, how do I treat stenosis? How do I treat some of this lumbar disc stuff? We've had this discussion with um, a lot of our students. We've had a Discussions recently on discogenic uh, back pain where, you know, applying directional preference and repeated motions type things. Uh, we've had the gamut of discussions as far as we're, uh, with our coaching and mentoring folks. And if that's something you're interested in your practice, like how do I develop that clinical practice instead of just like trying to friggin' navigate social media, you know, throwing 40 different opinions at me, all of which nobody's given me any application pieces of how do I apply it to that unique person in my practice? Um, maybe you can't just jump into residency and fellowship. It's not financially feasible for you. Uh, but you want somebody to start getting in your practice and helping you develop that process to get good. If you're interested in something like that, reach out to Jared and I or jump on modernpaincare.com forward slash supercharged. Um, and you can set up a call with us and we'll, we'll chat with you and see where you are clinically. If it's something we feel like we can help you with, we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like. Or if it's something we can point you to some resources for and help you start getting a, you know, uh, you know, a, some articles together or some different things together where you can start helping yourself in your practice. Definitely don't hesitate to reach out, jump on one of those calls or just message us on social media, reach out to Jared or I, Mark at modernpaincare.com or Jared at modernpaincare.com. And we're happy to have some discussions with you. Our, our focus is just improving what we're doing in our craft and helping people out. I think we have opportunities as PTs, Kairos and others. If we just adopt some better processes and better, more modern understandings, I think we can really make a better, bigger impact in the world of healthcare and the world of people who are, who are dealing with pain. So I think we'll finish with that, Jared. Um, anything else you want to add before we sign off for today? No, no, no. I think, I I think that we, we can wrap that one up. Uh, I'm excited to hear what questions come up from it. Yeah, definitely reach out to us. If you guys have any other questions or if you have any other thoughts on things you want to hear us talk about, maybe there's some clinical things that are stumping you in the clinic that you'd like to hear our opinion on. As you can see, Jared and I probably aren't short on opinions, but again, hopefully you see that they're backed up by more than just, uh, you know, our, our, our thoughts of uh, random thoughts out of nowhere. It's usually evidence-based and based on what we're seeing in the clinic. So until next time, you guys have a good rest of your week and we'll talk to you then.